<laughs> but yeah, but bad. This is my my only second time using this this specific app for the podcast, but oh, it's pretty cool. But man, dude, how are you? Thank you for uh for coming on and talking to me. It's an honor, man. I appreciate you reaching out. I'm I'm good. I just got back from um from PT. I like I, I fucked my my neck up in some kind of weird way, so just Damn. getting back to the crib. But I'm I'm pretty good. <laughs> what did you do? I don't know, man. Like I turned, I'm, I'm 31. I turned 30, and my body just started to like rebel against me. So like just random Fuck. things start hurting. You know what I mean? But we here. Yeah, damn. I'm really not looking forward to that, dude. I'm about to be 30 kind of soon, and man, bro, en- enjoy this shit while you have it. Like I thought it was a joke. People were like, "You like you turn 30, and a switch flicks," but that that, that shit is real. Like, Fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I turned 30 within three months. I'm like going to the PT, going to the chiropractor. I'm like, damn, this is like instantaneous. I feel like I need to go eat some motherfucking sea moss right now and try to... Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just start doing yoga and everything. Yeah, hopefully I can flip that switch the same way my... <laughs> yes. <laughs> but shit, man, so you're in D.C., huh? What, what, are you, uh, what are you working on these days, man? Oh, man. So my wife and I, we launched a creative agency called the Creative Summer Company. Uh, it was last summer, actually. Did it kind of quietly, but um, we help uh, a lot of Black-owned brands and businesses just to to market themselves better, to like tell themselves better, tell their stories better without, without trying to like kind of whitewash their shit or like without trying to take away from who they actually are. Um, so right now, man, just... Um, doing a lot of work for clients right now at the agency um you know doing some of my own writing and just trying to um figure out my next book right um and just uh continue to kind of put out like whatever makes sense to me you know yeah i was uh i was checking out the affirmations man that that's pretty dope that's like a dope concept for a book it seems like it also give it's encouraging to me, like someone with very severe ADD and that doesn't really, mm. uh, big writing projects have always been really daunting to me. And like, yeah. I just thought it was a dope concept, like writing these little nugget sized, like, it's like a little slider, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> exactly. I really appreciate it. Um, so what's funny is, and I'm actually saying this on air for the first time, I think I'm undiagnosed, but I think there's something going on with me as well. Um, what I know for sure is that I was scared that I wasn't going to finish the book. So I literally chose to like write these short affirmations so I could literally just knock out like a hundred words per day instead of yeah. being scared to like not finish a chapter. Um, yeah. So like that was a big part of why, you know, I made it so short. Man, I'm like working on this, this project now. It's a... Uh... It's a series, a television series, and mm-hmm. um, I'm like the you know the main writer on it, which is I've already written more pages on that than I did like my whole high school career. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I'm I'm dead ass some of these days. Like, I just to psych myself into it, I'll just be mm-hmm. like, I'm literally finna write like three lines of dialogue in this yep. scene. Like, I'm just gonna say one little back and forth. But then you know, once you get started, if it's a project you actually care about too, you'll mm-hmm. probably end up you know getting in a little bit of a flow state and getting it going but man i always like you know it's been a huge issue just mentally making things out to be this huge thing Mm -hmm. that's going to be so terrible and you know yeah and you finally kind of get into it you're like oh wow like two hours passed like yeah especially if it's something you know you wanted to do it's like a project Mm -hmm. you chose to (laughs) to take on and shit yeah 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 yeah. i'm surprised you um you struggle with writing I, i never think that artists like struggle with things like that because you have to like put so many things together to like make one song or or whatever else that's kind of interesting to hear it's like a totally different type of writing because like Mm -hmm. with music there there's like the production as like a almost like a safety net you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like oftentimes you know 99 percent of rappers start with a beat you know i mean they pick a Mm -hmm. beat and then they go off of that so it's like you're already kind of being led in different directions and you can you have something to go off of where i kind of right. make the analogy to like um stand-up comedy or something where it's like to me that's always been something that looked really scary because mm-hmm. it's just you like there's no and and there's no structure really like with comedy it's like 
it just if it's funny then it's then it works but there's no mm -hmm. structure to follow like that's mandatory you know what i mean like with music pretty much even your most experimental song is still going to have drums it's still going to have some synths it's still going to have vocals like there's still going to be those core elements regardless of how how it gets freaked but like with a joke it's just a person with a mic and right. like what comes out of their brain needs to like be artistic and entertain you and if it doesn't then like it's just a person standing up front of you talking so i don't know it's really crazy and from a you know i stopped writing too my music a couple years ago i do Word. what's called um punch cuts that's when i like mm -hmm. i'll like freestyle for a couple bars record it freestyle a couple more bars record it and then mm. so you know, I saw Lil Wayne do it in like 2004, and I was like, "Oh, you know." <laughs> <laughs> if he's making it happen, you have to do it that way. Yeah, I was like, "Well, Wayne's the goat. I want to be the goat, or at least close. I want to be good, at least." That's... And you know, I can't be out here. And I just felt like I was gonna look like a cornball, you know, like every. I feel right, like right, if right. Wayne's doing it, then this is what everybody's about to be doing. And right, especially when know. like you hear like Jay's not writing this shit, Wayne's not writing this shit. So like, well, I may as well just you know just jump out there. <laughs> yeah, but then Drake kind of corrected the whole shit when he came out with the BlackBerry. He was like, "Fuck what y'all yeah. talking about? I'm writing it down." <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, and I mean to be fair, like at the same time, like Drake is you know Drake's kind of an actor. You know, what I mean, you know, I don't know if he's always. Like, he is talking about the things that he's lived, but it's not in the same way that I feel like a Wayne or a Jay is. They're like, look, I live this shit. Like, Wayne was in the game at, like, what, age 13, I think? Like, like 11, bro. You know? So it's like, you can't even escape it being, like, his life. And you already know about Jay, too. So I could see that being a different thing, whereas, like, I feel like Drake's, like, it is his life, but he's also putting, like, this, this kind of costume on. You know, definitely like to find a way to like make his shit connect. Yeah, I think um, I don't even know. Drake, it, it's weird because I spent the first half of Drake's career being like not overly impressed. You know what I mean? Because I was like mm -hmm. Mr. Indie Underground guy and he was super yeah. big and mainstream. So like I didn't have no beef on. I didn't like dislike the guy, but I just didn't mm -hmm. really give him much attention. I was, he was just like yeah. one of them radio guys, but he's turning into a really complex kind of think piece on culture, bro. Cause mm -hmm. um, it's, cr it's crazy. Like he's like by far the biggest artist. He does shit really weird. And it's, he's like the first dude where it's like, he comes off authentic a lot, but he mm -hmm. also comes off kind of not authentic a lot. Yeah, And it's hard to reconcile those two. But I mm -hmm. think that balance is his authenticity. You know what I mean? Like him understanding that, listen, guys, sometimes I'm going to just do something for money. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily about me dropping the hottest shit right now. Right. And I think that's his truth. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it kind of almost fits. Like, I think Drake is like, I'm 31. I think Drake's like a bit older than me. He's like 33. He's almost, yeah. yeah, I think he's 33, somewhere in there. But I feel like he fits like the younger demographic where they can just be like, you know, on TikTok or wherever, be like, look, I'm going to get this money and that's authentic to me right now, you know, where I'm going to go off and do this. And like, that shit is cool too. You know, like it, it makes sense to like this next generation, like after us, when you put it that way. So yeah, no, that's really interesting. He does capitalism extremely well. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not always the biggest fan of those tactics, but I think mm -hmm. when you recognize what he's going for, you got to give it to him that he's executing his plan mm -hmm. extremely well. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like doing very well for like his brand of light skin man, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I really felt like Chano was, was on his ass for a second. Like he was damn near about to be, you know, the next light skinned ambassador. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I still yeah. think he has that, has that opportunity. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I think like Chance like just took it like in a different direction. Like he's he's definitely like doing his thing, like made his own lane, but it's definitely it's definitely a different lane. It's a different lane. I just think like Drake had like it wasn't ever preachy. He was mm. just making like bop like sometimes bops for basic people, something you know what I mean? And like mm -hmm. I think like Chance didn't pursue that like club aspect as much. And I mm. think in rap that becomes like a that's a really big 
part of being like the top top dude like you can get huge without the club like obviously chance did it but mm -hmm. to to reach that like apex like number one i do think you got to be one of the go-to guys at the party too you know yeah. what i mean and no, that's I one of those things that. it's crazy like but i feel like the j cole kendrick you know thing they kind of circumvent mm -hmm. it they're like the biggest dudes that aren't like super club heavy but yeah 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 but I mean, yeah. I think I think Kendrick and um, and Cole have even more like they they still have like some club records, um, yeah. like more so than um, than Chance does. Are you familiar with um, a, a writer and a poet who goes by Hanif um, Abdurraqib? I don't think I am. No, um, he's like he's a brilliant writer to me, um, and he just like he'll talk about like pop culture or rap but in a way where it's like more so just talking about life. Um, and I don't, I don't want to like misquote the essay, but Hanif wrote about how like Chance, he, um, he, he's really good at like just being happy. Um, and like it comes out in his music and it's like, it, it makes him like endearing, but it also makes him like very different than like a lot of like hip hop artists which feels like like that and then like kind of the gospel is like why he's never going to be like a big club artist, right? Because he's just yeah. in this different like space. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, for sure. But... Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so how long you been in D.C., dude? Is that where you're from originally? So I live, um, I live in Virginia, like two miles south of D.C. And I've been there since. Is that I Alexandria? Finished... Yeah, you been you you been down here or something or? Yeah, bro, I've done mad shows in DC. I fuck with bro. Okay. I, yo, I, I've had Look, to I've, I've had to get there. carried off U Street a, a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I feel that because you. I think you came to closed sessions or whatever else. I, I'm not sure if I was there or not, but which yeah. is odd because that's the same name as the indie label I was signed to in Chicago, closed mm -hmm. sessions, and we I, ended I'm very here. unceremoniously. It was not. We, it was not on good terms. So it was. Yes. <laughs> so it was. It was. It, I low key had a little bit of beef because this. I did that show after I had already split with the label, and so mm -hmm. I'm seeing on this flyer, it's like closed sessions presents Alex Wiley right. in DC, and I'm like, wait, 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 didn't didn't we split with those guys? Like, who <laughs> <laughs> were? They're now throwing my shows outside of the city like what the fuck's oh, going so now on you, so now you paying me like <laughs> right. all right exactly i'm like oh so now you want to pay now i'm selling our shows in dc now you now you want to break bread right but, uh, damn i think i might have just violated my nda by saying that but what's up hey man i didn't this, i didn't hear a word yeah, um, also this podcast ain't making no money dude sue the podcast <laughs> have a ball have a blast <laughs> but uh, nah, i got but, you but yeah fuck um what's that place on u street that's famous for the like chili burger do you know what i'm talking about Oh, you, what you mean like the, the tourist spot? Exactly. I'm about to yeah. shit on it. I'm not here to say it's fire. Oh, okay. I was, yeah. I was curious. Um, it's called Ben's Chili Bowl. And then, oh. uh, am I capping for feeling like yum yums, like Chinese food is, is where you get the mambo wings? I don't know. Nah, that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's where it's at. Like, I'm pretty sure you're right. What do you mean pretty sure, bro? Why you don't know? I'm Why you always don't know? like, <laughs> <laughs> Why you don't know where I'll be like, I go in the city. I don't always stay in the city. So like, I live in Virginia. I don't live in DC. You know what I mean? So I'm not, I'm not doing like a lot of takeout and stuff like that. I'll go for like events, like shows, things like that. But I'm more so out in Alexandria and like the Potomac Yard area. So I couldn't even tell you some of the takeout spots. Have you ever been to Chicago? Um, my mom is from Chicago, actually. Oh, wow. um, I haven't been since I was like literally. I might have been like ten if not younger but yeah mm -hmm. there's like a a subculture sort of debate between chicago and dc about our wings uh you know, i don't know if you if you know about our our mild sauce thing there's this place called harold's out here that uh, uh -huh. it's like a staple like it's mad old like my parents grew, like my grandparents was eating it in the maybe, oh, maybe not that long ago but definitely the 60s it was around and they have okay. this sauce called mild sauce it's like a it's just like a, a, a Chicago delicacy, but are you familiar with the Mambo, like the DCs, you know what I mean? Oh, the, absolutely. Yeah, like, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's close. It's kind of a blasphemous thing for me to say, but it's, it's some. Um, Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So you, you on record now saying that you might rock with like the DC sauce as much as the Chicago sauce. Just, um. I'm on record just, saying that <laughs> DC, people in DC are our brothers and we don't uh, need to be going against each other. 
You know what okay. I mean? Okay. We need unity. We all like sweet, tangy sauces on our chicken. That's fair. That's fair. And I think we have a lot more in common than, <laughs> than differences. You're, you're bridging the gap very well right now. I respect that. <laughs> That's going to be my platform, dog. In 20 years, I'm going to be running for office and right. uh, buying people's votes with just like <laughs> wing samples outside the, the, <laughs> the polling right. place. Right, 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 right. Don't be like um, Mayor Bowser. <laughs> Who is that? I don't know. <laughs> so Mayor Bowser is the mayor of D.C. And I'm, I'm fairly positive she was like, she like, either tweeted or put on Instagram that she doesn't even like like mumbo sauce or whatever else. And she's the mayor of DC. So like it was this big controversy. For yeah, like that's weeks. Yeah, that's just bad. That's honestly, that's almost worse than like a legitimate political scandal because that's like cultural. You know what yeah, I mean? It was tough. It was I'd tough. almost rather find out you like misappropriated some funds or something because it's like, <laughs> you, you know, you guys all do that. That's fine. <laughs> But the sauce, though? The like, sauce. You can't disrespect the things we care about. <laughs> that's so, a fact. Man, dude, on some political shit, like, I don't know. It's a broad question, but how are mm -hmm. you feeling about things? Because I'm thinking a lot. Ooh. And um, just, like, the state of our system mm -hmm. and to tr kind of rectify what's going on in America and the world. Like, what what's your viewpoint on capitalism? What's Oof. your viewpoint on voting? How do you feel about Biden? And feel free to like diplomatic it up. I mean, I understand you got a business to run. We're not out here to yeah. fucking uh, get ourselves canceled. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what's crazy is like you were just talking about your NDA. Um, I have been instructed okay. to talk okay. extensively about like politicians. I feel um, you. I feel you. Okay. You know, no, it didn't. <laughs> That's crazy. I just like popped up. Um, I will. I will say this. That's how we know I, you get into that right. bag. So I, oh, I can't talk to. I can't talk about Biden. That's my man's. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we just go back, like way, way, way back. Yeah, no, nah, he would uh, Jill wouldn't like that. I wouldn't be good at the barbecues no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? They really they've looked out for a long time. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, shit, I will say um, as far as so you asked me about a couple of different things. Um, I I was raised to believe that like capitalism was like the best thing in the world um Same. like many of us were yeah um and i think it's just it's really interesting like i went to i went to public schools in a pretty good neighborhood and then for some reason i went to a military academy um which I still can't believe. Like when I think back, were you like, bad? Were you fucking up? Like why did they? Why did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but nah. Um, now nah, it was a military like university, so it was like this. You know, really hard to get into like prestigious university. Um, and my my parents went there as well. Um, and I had like some friends who would go in there, and it's you know it's just a, it's a really a really really good school. You know what I'm saying? So it seemed like a good choice to make. Um, but I, to get back to like the capitalism conversation, I am, I am amazed that I thought it was a good thing or like the best thing for as long as I did. Um, and it's just, it's, it's crazy to hear about or to understand more about, you know, concepts like communism, socialism, and to see what they actually are, um, as compared to what we were told they were, yeah. um. And I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that, but yeah, it's it's crazy to see um, the way they've been misrepresented um, in comparison to what they actually are. Yeah, I feel that. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I just have this idea. I mean, I don't know if it's like, it's not like an idea. It's not like an original thought, I guess, but, um, and I don't know how plausible it is, but it seems to me what might be the best solution for kind of rectifying the things we need with what we have is, I feel like the idea of some sort of like capitalism, socialism hybrid is probably what's going to be needed in, in my opinion, because I think we could keep, um, you know, this sort of free trade situation and competition and all of that. And if we cap earnings on billionaires, there'd be enough money to, you know, create a, a huge social safety net. And I think even, you know, a small UBI, you know, you're familiar with the, the UBI shit, the, the universal basic income sort of yeah. principles yeah yeah i think it makes a lot of sense because i think 
we could eradicate homelessness. We could eradicate mm-hmm. like that super like unacceptable level of poverty here. But also, rich people could still do their thing. If you want to fucking mm-hmm. invent an app or some shit that doesn't really help anybody, but if people want to use it, you make a bunch of money. Like do your thing and right. Um, I don't know, man, because I just feel like the way things are going, it's kind of untenable. This isn't this isn't sustainable, man. Like mm-hmm. who's gonna if you keep eliminating the middle class and just crushing crushing the masses who's even gonna buy your fucking amazon shit one day Mm -hmm. you know what i mean i think at a certain point it's in the best interest of even the billionaires to make sure everybody's okay yeah and fuck man i just think this this greed is it's running unchecked i think everybody thinks that they're just you know they're they're gonna die before the shit hits the fan or something you Mm -hmm. know what i mean and yeah no i think it's um I saw this this video and it was shown it it showed you like a grain of rice and that was like a hundred thousand dollars and it showed you like how much a million dollars is you know up to like a hundred billion which people like Warren Buffett have and it's like it's crazy to see how like concentrated wealth is um, when like it doesn't have to be that way yeah you know maybe just people shouldn't be able to have a hundred billion dollars like there's literally i think the cap should be one billion i think once you get to 999 million 999 thousand 999 dollars and 99 cents every penny over that goes towards something that's going to help everybody because we're like dude listen you know granted your company's making a lot more money that's fantastic for you guys but Mm -hmm. you still get to you know private planes mansions wherever you want like dude a billion dollars there's nothing you can't do there's Mm -hmm. nothing on god's green earth you can't do and um yeah dude i think that should be the rule man i don't think people because if you capped it at a billion all that excess we could fix all kind of shit dude we could Mm -hmm. really fucking but i don't know I i remember like reading about like how much we would need um to be able to just like put every homeless person into a house many of which are like vacant by the way right so you have yep. a lot of vacant houses and a lot of homeless people and a lot of folks with like just money they couldn't spend over the next like 10 100 generations you know what yeah. i mean so it just feels like I'm, I'm not a policy expert i'm not an economist but i do think like people being able to store money is less important than people being able to survive and to live um so yeah that's that's my think, do you think there's some sort of like conspiracy aspect to it maybe because or like is it just that the people with the money just are like dude i'm not giving my money up or do you think there's almost like a government sort of thing of a like dude hey even if you wanted to do that nah mm-hmm. like this system yeah. that we have this is what it is it's this way for a reason and mm-hmm. it's easier to whack a billionaire than it is to let him change a thousand years of history right 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 well i mean i think my opinion is that you look at how the ultra rich function um they are oftentimes like they want the money not just for the money but to like push their agenda the and to like protect their money their power and their status um and then they turn around and they they fund politicians who like end up making the rules you know what i mean so it's like they have amassed so much power that they're able to dictate, you know, to a certain extent what the government even does. So, yeah, yeah, it's It's like being the owner of a sports team or something like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like two billionaires facing off, but they're not facing off. It's like the people, the the millionaires that they've like bought facing off. Mm -hmm. And it's literally like that. It's like, you know what I mean? They go in and they're voting and it's just like, the the two main interests or whatever the main interests are duking it out with these mm-hmm. proxies right but i don't know and most of um i think like i know mark cuban i know like steve Ballmer, like a few of them but i probably wouldn't know like half of the billionaires who own these nba teams i saw yep. them on the street you know they Definitely don't care about not. being known they don't care about signing autographs it's just like i'm gonna stay in the cut i'm gonna get this money and i'm gonna do really whatever i want you know yeah Fuck. <clears throat> that shit is insane, man. <laughs> it really uh, is. I don't know, dude. I don't know what we're going to... I don't know what's what's going to happen. Are, are you into, like, uh, technology, like, futurism at all? Does that does that interest you? Like, the... Thing okay. you, what's your thoughts on... Uh, like, are you familiar with, like, the, the 5G shit and, like, 
you know, six, what what six G could mean. You you know what know about that? I haven't heard what six G could mean. I mean, I'm assuming just like faster internet speeds and everything else, or is it like but something like groundbreaking? It would be groundbreaking because the the internet speeds would like cross a threshold where um, just mm-hmm. all sorts of insane shit would be possible. Like um, the implications mm-hmm. of it are really crazy. Like downloading like terabytes it instantly. Like what that mm-hmm. would mean is like. Um, like augmented reality will get really crazy because all the renderings is it's just you can do way more infinitely complex stuff with mm. way more just like mundane devices it, it'll also kind of introduce the internet of things if you're familiar with that that's where like pretty much anything that uses electricity will also be internet enabled therefore mm. like um because yeah dude at a certain point man once they get far enough advanced with the shit it's not gonna be like a hot spot or like wi-fi or shit you log into it's just like the the planet has 5g mm-hmm. and 6g so your, yeah like your fridge talks to your microwave talks to your home heater talks to this talks to that and there's already like housing complexes that are built this way where um all the all the appliances in the whole like complex speak Mm -hmm. to each other to like best use resources so they're not like all washing dishes at the same time or like not all you know what i mean it does a lot of crazy shit but it kind of freaks me out dude i think it's gonna be the um that thing for our generation because i think every generation has a thing technologically Mm -hmm. that just turns your whole perception like on its ear i think it was like radios television Mm -hmm. phone you know cell phones then computers, mm-hmm. and I think for us it's going to be, and every time it's something that like people couldn't really foresee how that was going to change right, everything. Right. I think for us it's going to be like the just the connectivity going to a whole nother level. Like, mm-hmm. um, I've read shit that like you know there's like internet enabled contact lenses already that are patented and shit. The implications mm-hmm. of that. If you have like the full functionality of an iPhone in your contact lenses, if I have it and you have it, mm-hmm. telepathy is real now. Because I can send you a text message from my brain, you'll get it in your brain, and we're talking now. See, I'm already freaked out by, you know how you like be on the phone talking about like, oh, I need a new cell phone. You see like an ad for a new phone like on um, one of your timelines. It'll like, be your thoughts. <laughs> I'm imagining it, bro. That is not. Nah, that's too much. It's too like I'm, much. <laughs> it's like the Instagram algorithm, but just like with everything in your life. Like that's that's too much, especially when you combine it with you know capitalism, right? Like it'll be like, oh, he looked twice at that Snapple. We finna we finna throw Snapple at this man every day. Ah, <laughs> <like>, thanks. <laughs> we gonna be like, oh, he walked past the burger spot. We know he's on a diet, but he smelled that burger and he wants it. Like now we about to, yeah. you know. <laughs> Bro, we're going to move the, the food truck, you know, two blocks down this way. Nah, that's, that is crazy. That's like legit crazy. But it's a th- it's like it already exists. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, they're able to read brainwaves. That's the thing. Like, it's like when you get like if someone loses a limb and they give mm-hmm. you one of the new prosthetics that you can like open and close with your brain and pick shit up. Have you seen that before? I've seen black hair, but no, dude, it's a thing. It's been a thing for like 10 years where now if you lose your hand, they have the technology to like, they can pick up the like electrical signals coming from your brain down through your arm, the, the shit that would be, you know, the basically the signal that's controlling like open, close, this, that. They can mm-hmm. like read that. And now your prosthetic, you could literally like, you know, fucking pick, pick shit up with it. And it's cause it's, you know, interpreting the brain signal from your brain that's trying to tell your hand, hey, do this, do that. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. That shit freaks me out. It's like a crazy rabbit hole you can go down. I've like gone down it a few times of just like when you see in a vacuum all the things that are possible and then you start to connect like if they put that and that together, these two things that are already possible, there's now something that literally was like science fiction that's like dead ass a thing we can do in real life now. Yeah. That also could be like terrifying at the same time. Super terrifying, bro. <laughs> Super terrifying. The, I read this one. This one is like not really science. This one is more like kind of fictiony. But um, uh-huh. they're exploring like what it might look like to finally do like interstellar travel, like traveling way, way out. And one of the prevailing theories involves like three D printing and lasers, where they would like they're trying to figure out how to um, encode 
uh, human DNA into a laser where like the same way, like I could send you a text message and our phones mm-hmm. aren't connected in any way, but you're still getting my message. It's like, mm-hmm. they're trying to figure out how to do that with a laser where they could beam the information like way further out than you could ever fly. And um, they're trying to like beam the information to do a 3D printing. And this is pretty far out, but what they're hoping to do eventually is beam out the specs to build a 3D printer and somehow have it kind of, you know, AI, um, um, you know, self-learning fucking build itself out there so that if you have a 3D printer way the fuck out, then you can beam all kind of information out to it and it'll print out things. And the, the idea is that basically to, to teleport way out there, what it'll probably be is like a fucking clone of you or something. It'll be like a 3D printer, but for biomaterial. You know what I mean? Like a bio, but all these things, there's like billions of dollars getting spent on, um, like studying these things. This is shit that Mm -hmm. the people with all that kind of money, they're trying to figure out how to live forever. They're trying Mm -hmm. to figure out how to get the fuck off of this planet if they need to. Like, I think those are the, when you got that much money where there's just, you're like a literal king walking around here. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, I think I think it sends you into a whole crazy train of thought. And my bad, I just rambled mad long about that, but it's... it's cool, man. It's I'm awesome. sitting here, like, writing down things that I'm going to start Googling when we finish this podcast. Like, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. And, um, no, I think, you're, I think you're right. Like, people who amass, like, that much wealth and then, like, that much power, like, they're doing it, you know, for reasons. Like, you could easily stop and be comfortable with, like, a cool 10 million or 100 million or whatever else, but, like... You'd be so chilling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So like at that point it's like you don't really care about money anymore it's just like a thing you have you yeah. know so you start thinking about it's like a <laughs> view count. Power. It, it becomes like a like a view counter like it becomes almost like a social media stat where it doesn't even mm-hmm. really equate to a tangible thing it's just this mm-hmm. mad this huge abstract number associated with your name it's like your follower count or something it's like mm-hmm. you don't even but yeah <sighs> But yeah, man, the, the technology shit definitely freaks me out. Because I think um, all that, like, Neuralink shit, too, that Tesla's talking about, the ultimate end implication of that is to be able to fully, like, atom for atom replicate a human brain. Like, that's what they're trying to do. Because if you can go atom for atom, in theory, if like, if you don't really believe in, like, God and souls and stuff, which I do, but a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, scientists don't really. So, yeah. but if you don't believe in that, then in theory, if you can go atom for atom, you can fully capture someone's consciousness because in theory, w- your consciousness is just, it's just your brain, you know, it's, it's every, but it, you know, it's everything that's going on in there, which mm-hmm. is unfathomably complicated. But, um, if in theory they were able to go atom for atom, replicate all the things that are going on, all the connections in your brain, in theory, that should be you in that computer. And that's that Black Mirror shit. But Black Mirror prides themselves on um, only incorporating concepts that have like a basis in what's possible now. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, but, uh, like it's, it's too close for comfort. So you have to like kind of stop and say, whoa, this could happen in like 10 years. Yeah, bro. But mm-hmm. I don't know. That's like the, the weird shit that I'm like, damn, they're finna do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like some mad scientist shit. Yeah. But, yeah. Man, I guess uh, so. I, there was a couple topics that we wanted to definitely touch on. I guess I, I kind of just freestyled for a bit, but um, about writing for one, mm-hmm. because I guess one of the themes of the podcast is um, um, a big part of the people that kind of uh, are follow me or in tune with me are like other creators and artists themselves. Like I just see mm-hmm. it a lot. Like the people that hit me up, I click on their links and there's like a SoundCloud link and there's like this, mm-hmm. there's that. It's like other creators. And I'd like to talk just about like, how you kind of got started in the industry and how you were able to catch a couple of breaks and just if there's any, you know, having that type of conversation as people that have um, been lucky enough to kind of like make a career out of our creation. And I think that's what a lot Mm -hmm. of people want and you know what I mean? So like, how how does your story as far as, um, you know, becoming someone that can do what you do for a living, you know, how did, how did you Mm -hmm. get into this? How did it, how did it work out for you? really randomly and like haphazardly right um so i think i told you i went to a military academy um i went there for four years got expelled right before i graduated with my bachelor's degree like literally like 
two weeks before I graduated, I was like driving home and figuring out <laughs> where I go to school next. Um, but while I was there, can you say why like, they expelled you or, or you want to leave it alone? Oh, no, nah, it's cool. So I went to, um, I went to military academy and they have like a lot of rules. Um, and I got expelled for having a female cadet in my bedroom. I see. Uh, <laughs> this is for my expulsion, you know? Um, That's whack. But, yeah, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. That's whack, um, dude. They yeah. shouldn't, ex- that's whack. <laughs> they should have just been like, hey, y'all don't do that in, in two more weeks and then you guys have a blast, but don't do that. For- <laughs> you know, um, but while I was there, um, there just weren't a lot of people who were there, like, like me at all, not just like black, but like creative, but like curious, you know, it was a lot of people who like majored in engineering. And of course, we were all like preparing to go into the army. So it just wasn't my scene. Um, but that kind of like pushed me to like get on Twitter in its early days and just start to like express myself and kind of get get active and figure out what I cared about. Um, so for 10 years, actually, I ran a rap blog. We actually wrote about you. I'm not sure if you remember, but I ran um, Artistic Manifesto. So oh, like, what? That was you? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm, I super am up on Artistic Manifesto. I used to read it. You guys did really good write-ups on me, dude. You guys yes. did. I used to look forward to reading the Artistic Manifesto write-up because it was the... I'm sure I've tweeted it out numerous times, too, because it was always one of my favorites. That's really crazy. I, yeah. no, I really remember Artistic Manifesto and like, cause there were just numerous times I would drop a song and I felt like the, reading it, it felt like the mm-hmm. person writing it like, damn, like you really listened to this shit. That was dope. Yeah. But man, really that's crazy. That, right? That's, um, no, nah, I really appreciate that because we didn't, like we didn't get like a lot of coverage and stuff all the time or like a lot of the love that like the more connected blogs got. Um, but that was what pushed me to like, to figure out how to write better for the first time, right? And um, I think like just my my personality um, and my consistency and, you know, I thought I was funny, right? Uh, (laughs) Me, You know, the jokes that I would make, I started to build an audience based on that, um, you know, on Twitter and then on Instagram. And um, that like allowed me to get the access to like meet different types of people um, to meet people who are like full-time entrepreneurs, to meet like artists. Um, I was a manager for a bit. I was kind of all over the place, but like me learning to write good enough to like attract different types of people is what kind of like threw me into this like creative world and eventually to be like industry adjacent. I don't think I've ever been really in like the industry per se, yeah. but I, I always had the access. Like I was, I was close enough. Um, That's and, the way I feel too. Yeah. 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 So just like, um, really just kind of staying up, staying plugged in, um, and continuing to like kind of hone my craft, right. As a writer. And then almost just like understanding like what I want to see from myself, like as far as visuals. Yeah. Never been a photographer or a videographer or whatever else, but I was into like photography and design enough to be able to say like, I want my shit to look like this, you know? It um, looks so very clean, that... by the way. I, you know, I checked out your, your Instagram just in doing research Thanks, for this episode, but yeah, Thanks, it looks man. it looks really clean. I imagine that's the type of stuff you do for your clients as well. Yeah, I, um, I, I largely, so my wife is a designer, um, so she does most of the design, but also, you know, I, I know what I like to see um, and I can like give people different examples of some good things that would help them with their like visual brand and everything else. Um, but largely, I'm just helping clients to figure out like, I mean, how do, how do you convey who you actually are online, right? Like, how do you do that naturally? How do you not get so caught up in like trying to push like your product or your project that you stop becoming yourself? Um, so just really kind of honing in on that. And, um, you know, like it's, it's a lot of just honestly, just like conversations and helping people to like, not be afraid to be themselves on the internet, not being afraid to be honest about things they don't like, you know, I think like a lot of us kind of get caught up in trying to like be the ideal person instead of just like being us, you know? Yeah. And that's what the bullshit is. Man, that's what's up. I think, um, yeah, with social media too, I've definitely undergone kind of a just a shift in 
perspective and thinking and um, just caring, like, I guess saying caring less isn't the right message, but caring less mm -hmm. in certain ways. We're not overthinking certain aspects of it. And as long as it's not just like a blatantly like fucked up thing to say or something like that, you're probably mm -hmm. okay to go ahead and let it rip. You know what yeah. I mean? And, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and just being, you know, I'm trying to be better about posting more things that I'm doing creatively too, because I've, mm -hmm. um, one of my issues has been just like, I'll drop something really cool and then I won't drop anything for like nine months. And it'll just mm -hmm. be like, ridiculous tweets for nine months like nothing <laughs> creative related whatsoever so i'm trying to be a little more focused on making shit and just putting it out and having a, a quicker turnaround too and i think that's yeah. good as a creator too to not um get into that cycle of now you're like because i think too when i sit on something for too long then it mm -hmm. puts a lot of pressure on it to like mm -hmm. be successful because yeah Especially too, if you've been showing it to people, it's like, yo, this when this drops, bro. Like, well, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The social media thing is really crazy, and I think, uh, man, it's just what you changed said our about, world. Yeah, what you said about uh, the way I heard you was like almost kind of getting anxious, right? About like putting out new things creatively. Um, I experienced that a lot too. Um, like I'll. You know, for me, like I'll drop an article or even just like writing about things intentionally on social media is almost like this, this nerve wracking part of it where you're like, okay, like I put all this time into it. Like I want it to resonate. I want it to do well, but you like, you, you, you scared it. if you put it out, it's not going to pop the way you want it to. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I've, I still have things in the chamber in the stash that I haven't put out for that same reason, you know, because once you kind of you build like a little bit of an audience, you start to feel like you have to like meet expectations and like be good enough. Cause now if you don't put it out, now if you put it out and it's not, it doesn't pop, like you feel like you let somebody down or like you're gonna lose whatever you built, you know? Yeah, or that it might just, you know, negatively affect, like I've gotten into thinking that if I drop something and it doesn't do like the numbers that it's, that I'm accustomed to doing, that it could like legitimately mm -hmm. hurt hurt my brand or like hurt the, yeah. you know, hurt the perception around me or something that, mm -hmm. um, you know, if people feel like you're falling off, that could kind of be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, I think it's good to flop sometimes. I think it's fun to flop sometimes. I think it's funny to flop sometimes. And okay. I've embraced flopping uh, partly because I think I've gotten to a stage in my career where I don't, I don't have as much to prove, I don't think. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not like a huge star or anything, but I've, I feel like I've done a good amount where I feel okay with like, I've done I've done some things. I don't feel like, yeah, you know what I mean? I feel a little more secure in that. And it's not even mm -hmm. just about accomplishments. I do think just age and understanding that like, we're all just, we're all gonna die. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it doesn't like, even the person we all think is the coolest ever, they're better than mm -hmm. us in every way. Like he's, he's going to. We're all going, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And flopping can be dope, dude. I, I, it's legitimately, I chuckle sometimes when I post something and I come back to it like an hour later, it has like seven likes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cause it's just, I don't know, it's just funny. Cause it's, it's like the internet version of like when you tell a joke or something and the room is just kind of silent. And to mm -hmm. me, that shit is funny. Like I, I, I've found a weird enjoyment in that of like, oh, y'all weren't feeling that, huh? My bad, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, no, nah, that's that's powerful. And I think like, honestly, I want to get to a space where I feel that way, too, because I wouldn't say that I'm I'm nowhere near as afraid as I was like even like two years ago um, to, to flop or whatever else. But I, I do still like like I'll come back and I'll be like, damn, like I thought I was going to do all this. I thought I was going to do like more numbers or get a better reaction or whatever else. I think for me, um, I forget who I first heard this from, but people oftentimes say that like you know i could i could flop today or i could procrastinate and flop in like six months but it's still just going to be what it is you know so it's almost that's it's better hard. to be like a mad scientist yeah that's you know? hard and uh, i think oh my bad no no say what you about to say no nah, you good that was that was most of it um just getting comfortable with the fact that like you really can't predict what's going to be the best thing in the world um no matter how many drafts you have or whatever yep. else you got to like get people's real-time reactions and that can like feed the next thing you create Timing, you know what i mean timing i've learned this i've learned this from chance too timing is more important than even the thing you're putting out 
Hmm. Straight up. As long as the thing's not just complete dog shit, it's better mm-hmm. to put something out 80% done at the right time than 100% mm. done too late. Mm. I really believe that. I think, because for one, it's never really finished in my mind, at least. There's always something I could, you know, it's like, uh, uh, fuck, um, there's like this, this, uh, this story, it's like a parable or whatever. It's, I think it was, um, um, who did the Sistine Chapel? Uh, uh. Um, um, not Da Vinci, um, Michelangelo? Michelangelo. There's like a story. He, I, I should have <laughs> known that right away, too. I, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I went to art school, too. But, um, <laughs> oh, damn. That's worse than you. Only okay, a semester, and I dropped out immediately. So, but still. But, um, <laughs> in any case, though, there's like this story. He got like commissioned by some, um, like prince or somebody to do a sculpture of him. And mm-hmm. the guy. Oh, I'm about to say something a little bit racist. Uh, I might have to edit this out. I'm going to say it. Um, the, the the guy was Italian, and apparently he had kind of a bigger, you know, a bigger nose. And they were, um, the, he didn't like the way his sculpture looked. He was like, dude, mm-hmm. my nose isn't that big. Like, fuck out of here. Like, go fix that. And it was big as hell. Like, so Michelangelo, Michelangelo's like, dude, I'm looking at you. You know, no mm-hmm. offense, but this is, this is how you look. You know what I mean? This is not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or look bad you, i'm doing an right. accurate you know i'm doing what i'm, I'm doing I'm michelangelo dude so right. fucking uh but michelangelo just humors the guy he grabs a handful of dust goes up on the ladder and kind of is chiseling but he's not really knocking shit off and he's just kind of letting dust fly out of his hand as he chisels he doesn't change a thing and when mm-hmm. he comes back down the prince is like all right you know he looks at it he's like all right thank you you know what i mean even though nothing <laughs> nothing changed whatsoever right and i think the metaphor for that is, I forgot why I even said that, what that had to do with what I was talking about, but that... Talking about timing. But also just that, like, I don't know, you can always change it, but oftentimes, even after three months of changes, this has happened numerous mm-hmm. times, like, I changed something for three months, and then I ended up still just putting out the version from three months ago, because mm-hmm. I went down this whole rabbit hole of, like, all these changes, and now I'm unsure about the changes, I'm, you know, mm-hmm. and I end up just putting out the f- very first version... Mm-hmm. And and then flopping because I fucked up the timing. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean the good thing is like nobody else. Well, most people have no idea that you were sitting on this thing for like three months. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it sounds fresh to them, even yeah. though you probably have played it literally ten thousand times um, since you first made it. You know, so that's the benefit of trying to make you know timeless content is that mm-hmm. if you do it right, it should be impactful at any point. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, man, dude. I don't know. I, I think um, yeah. I feel like we had a good conversation. I don't know if there was anything else you maybe wanted to uh, cover. Do you have anything to promote? Um, no. I think this is a fun conversation. I love just like natural conversations as opposed to like you ever be on a podcast and somebody's like, "How can you be a better creative? What is like just like reading off, off a script or whatever else? Like I've yeah. experienced." conversations like that and those are those are tough i like this conversation i think it was cool um nah i mean if people enjoy the conversation um i'm on social media mikhail c clark everywhere um that's that's really it i don't have anything big to promote right now i feel like life is good you know if they want to find the agency um it's thecreativesummer.com um if they want to buy some affirmation based clothing um i'm at loveyourself.shop um, that's where we have all our clothes and everything else, but that's really it, man. Man, awesome. I guess in summation too, I just want to get a little bit of feel just on a personal side, like musically, what are, what are you bumping these days? How has the quarantine year affected just your Sheesh. house vibes? Like, what are you bumping around the crib? Like, how's your, you know, what's the day to day like? Um, I've been playing, have you heard of, uh, I think it's pronounced Cyril. Um, uh-huh. She's like an experimental, like really mellow pop artist. I've been playing her a lot. Um, I've been playing this new Vic and Wyclef and Chance. Oh yeah, uh, that's dope, man. That's yeah. that's good to see. That's yeah, good to it's, see. it's pretty smooth. Um, and I've been on this Brent Fias kick. Like I've been playing a lot of his stuff lately too. So that's where I've been at. When I'm not playing like DeBarge and like Anita Baker, <laughs> I'm playing like stuff too. So yeah. I feel you. I just went on a big ass uh, Curtis Mayfield day the other day. Oh uh, man. Yeah, he's from the crib. He's from Chicago. He grew up like not too far from me, so he was like a big, you know, big legendary presence growing up. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, what you been playing? Pusher Man? Like what else? 
Um, I like Pusha Man. I like um, Freddy's Dead is actually my favorite joint. He's like, mm-hmm. Freddy's Dead, that's what yeah. I said. Like, he, was, <laughs> he, he just sounded like 1974 on that bitch. He just sounded like the year. Like, yeah. nobody sounds like him. Like, he was, nobody sings like that anymore. Like, the super he high, like... like a- he just sounds like a dude, like actually in the back alley, like in the Cadillac, yeah. just like you know, like, like at the van, at the play, and let me stay in that, like hitting them high. It was like high pitch whispering, like on some actual, like I don't know if it's fucked up to just say he sounded like a pimp. That's maybe not, <laughs> but I feel you, and I'm also like he. I don't know if but anybody I want to put that on him. He was probably a good dude. You know what I mean? He probably wasn't on that at all. But I mean, probably, but. I, I think he knew some pimps at the very least. Um, he had to have known some pimps, right? Because I, I feel like I don't know anybody else who had a falsetto who could sound scary while singing in a falsetto. Yeah, I don't think I know anybody else who can do that. He had a he had like a, a back alley falsetto. He sounded mm-hmm. like yeah. He sounded like he was singing at you to give <laughs> give me your watch and give me all you know what I mean. But, but like politely. super polite <laughs> super respectful like if you don't cause a problem everybody's gonna go home fine it's gonna be okay but i but mm-hmm. i need that watch in that car though that's that's happening you're gonna give it to me like, yeah. easy. <laughs> <laughs> well shit man um dude thank you so much for uh coming on the show i really appreciate it and um dude anytime you want to talk we're you know we're going to be doing this weekly and this isn't like the type of thing where it's like a new guest every single time. I'm going to have like a nice little mm-hmm. like people we talk, you know, we kind of check back in on and stuff like that. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, man, dude, I appreciate it. And, you know, have a great rest of your day and feel free to hit me up about anything, dude. I was you know looking forward to talking to you and I'm glad we did. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. This is a really, a really fun conversation. Like for real, for real, I appreciate you. I'm excited to see it, you know, come out in whatever way. And I'll be in touch too. We got to wrap some more like off, offline, some kind of for way. For sure. For sure. Um, I'll connect you to. Oh, you you are connected with the producers of my show. That's also uh, who manages mm-hmm. me. Um, gotcha. But yeah, dude, we should coordinate on something. And also, you know, what I mean, you help people with their brands. I got a brand that needs helping. So <laughs> okay, let me know. Let's talk about it for sure, yeah. man. Well, yo, dude, have. A... Oh, what's up? I was gonna say we could even like create a barter or something else too. Um, I got you on a hot good. 16 for your next mixtape. No problem. Yes, right. no. <laughs> Drop <the> affirmation bars. <laughs> oh, actually, I would go crazy on the affirmation first. I would right. never go gonna, crazy. Gonna talk for real then. <laughs> or in real life, bro, I've always wanted to do the voice for someone's audiobook, maybe. Mm. Okay, now we're talking, talking. Yeah, let's 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 connect. Yeah, now I gotta stop the recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>